Becca, hi, hello. Welcome to the Female Startup Club podcast. Thank you, June. It is my pleasure to be here. I am so excited to hear about your story. I was just saying this to you before we started recording, but I started following along. I think when you launched, I read about you in Lean Lux. And since then, you've obviously just popped up all over the place. So I'd been waiting to reach out to to get this, you know, set up. Um, and I'm obviously a really big tinned fish fan. And so I've just been drooling, reading all about you. But for those who don't know, can you introduce who you are and what your business is? Yeah. Um, so my name is Becca. I'm a co-founder. Uh, my my co-founder's name is Caroline Goldfarb. Um, co-founder and CEO of a new tin fish company called Fishwife. Um, and Fishwife is, we launched in December. Um, we're a new ethically sourced um, tin fish company. Right now, our, like, our, our sourcing thesis is just going to the places where they have the best and the most sustainable seafood. And we just try to bring it to people um, in a new, in a way that they have not been presented with, with tin fish. <laughs> For the past 50 years. <laughs> I feel that. I really feel that. And I'm definitely going to dig into your branding and your language and tone and all that kind of thing. But I want to start like really with the name. I'm super intrigued. I love Fishwife. It sounds like the coolest thing ever. Tell me about Fishwife. What's the meaning there? Totally. So Fishwife, first of all, I have to give full credit to my dear friend Greer Stockman, who is also an amazing a uh, woman entrepreneur. She and her sisters run a company called Block Shop. I encourage everyone to check it out. Um, shout out to her. Um, but we came up with we came up with the idea for the company, and I sort of we were calling all of our fellow entrepreneur friends in like all fields, not just food CPG. Um, and Greer, I think, just in googling, found the term fishwife, which was just so unbelievably perfect for what we were trying to achieve with the project. The like the etym- the etymology is it used to be a term that was used for the wives and daughters of fishermen who would sell their husbands' wares at the market. And because, you know, it's fish, it's highly perishable. Um they gained a reputation for being really bossy and like swearing and being like buy my goddamn fish. Um so then fishwife which was a neutral term um, came to take on this sort of this like sort of gendered insult for a loud bossy woman and then it has like this dual meaning of like these fishwives gained sort of like professional rights earlier than maybe some of their contemporaries um, because they had this power to control these businesses so it has this like dual toned entrepreneurial um, approach as well oh, love it I so love it. That's the coolest story ever. <laughs> what a great name. There was nothing else after we after we found that one. Totally. Coined it. Let's start from the beginning. Where does your entrepreneurial story start with the fish? Mm-hmm. With the fish. Um, <laughs> the fish in particular. So Caroline and I, my co-founder, were quarantining together. Um, like from the beginning. So March started quarantining together at the end of March last year. And we were living in sort of a remote desert, which not a lot of fish around. Um, But we were, we were on a hike and we were literally bouncing back and forth business ideas. Because when you're on a hike, you just talk about whatever, got plenty of time to gab. Um, And we had been, we'd been cooking this like gorgeous trout a lot for whatever reason, we become obsessed with this trout. And then we were just eating a lot of tin fish because it was just like such a perfect quarantine food. I think like all of us were pretty overwhelmed with how much time and energy it took to make like healthy, delicious food during quarantine. Because it wasn't like, at least for us, it wasn't like you're, you're like ordering a sweet green or like you're going to get a burrito somewhere. You're like in your house needing to make food for yourself. So we were naturally just eating a lot of sardines and tuna and mussels and all these things. Um, and then like as a background to that, I had lived in Spain in college for a short time. Caroline had somewhat recently traveled to Portugal and Spain. And like in those ex- European exploits, we'd both been exposed to the like elegance and sexiness um, and like casual allure of conservas and tin seafood, which it's just like you have that culture 
like going to a Spanish wine bar and like getting a tin of like beautifully decorated sardines. And then you have like going to an American grocery store and looking at the shelves and it's just like totally clinical, like absolutely devoid of any sexiness. And it was just like, why? Yeah. Why? why? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) We have chicken of the sea, which like if a grocer term exists please educate me so bad (laughs) so anyway we like came we were on this hike and then we were like we have to do this and we asked a couple of friends that were in the food world lucky enough to have some like food entrepreneur friends and food journalist friends and they were just everyone validated the, the idea and then like we just started fully working on it like the next day oh my god Genius. So it was born overnight on a hike from a love of fish, which we were all experiencing in quarantine. I feel like one of my favorite meals just in general is literally tinned fish with um, rice and like capers and some fresh tomatoes or whatever, like chopped on the side. So I'm there with you. Um, But, you know, back to the story. I want to cover all, all different corners here. And obviously we need to start with the branding. You have an extremely distinguishable brand. It's so cool. It actually brings me a lot of joy looking at your Instagram and and reading about um, reading about it. Who worked on the brand with you, and what was the kind of inspo behind the look and feel? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we thought. I mean, we we put a ton of of thought and energy into this, as you might imagine. Um, and the way this we sort of did it. I come from. I worked in music before this, and. Uh, did like sort of creative direction and marketing for artists. And the process there would always be to go on Instagram. Instagram is, it is very helpful for all of its, for all of its flaws. It's, it's an amazing database of information. Um, find different artists, illustrators, graphic designers, and like parse through who would best be able to communicate the, the, like con- the conceptual, um, just the concept behind a project. So we sort of just started digging into finding illustrators and artists that we thought would be a good fit for this. So we kind of had European conserve us um, and like the, the bold graphics and the vibrant colors and sort of like the simple uh, sim- symbolism um, was, was like the founding concept for the, for the visuals and the branding. Um, and then like a couple other brands were really inspiring to us, like Cafe Bustello, Topo Chico, just sort of these like utilitarian, but also really vibrant brands. Um, and that just had like sort of a classic feeling. Um, so that was, those were like the mood boards that we created. And then we found like 20 illustrators that we loved and we like pulled a bunch of friends about who they liked the best. And the person who we just kept coming back to was actually, was one of the only referrals that I got. Um, he's a local illustrator in LA guy, Danny, Danny Miller goes by Danbo. Um, and he just, he's like, He's done a ton of a ton of work with like hand hand drawn topography, patterning, pattern work, um, and then like a bunch of cartoon stuff. Like if you go to his Instagram, which everyone should, he put out his first comic book this summer, and it's just so beautiful. And he communicates so much in such a simple way. Um, and I mean, I can't like explain how uh, amazing a partner he's been throughout all this. He just does such a great job, and so lucky to have him in my life. <laughs> Gosh, that is so cool. Are you able to share like how much it costs to actually work with someone like that and how much it costs to kind of bring a brand to life when it comes to like a website and a logo and you guys have a lot of supporting elements and and the packaging and there's a lot going on there? I'd love to know. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's a a really, really good question. And I think um, it's so... I I understand why people would be uh, mystified by this because there are, I think a lot of startups work with branding agencies and like branding agencies are great. If like you have a budget and don't necessarily know exactly what you are trying to create in terms of a visual or a brand, um, or maybe you have an idea, but you really could use the help of a team to formulate it. Um, we like really knew what we wanted for the the visuals and so with someone like Danny, he had never done CPG, he had never done packaging before. And also CPG is consumer packaged goods. I don't know if everyone knows it's an acronym. Um, 
but he so he was sort of like we we asked him his fees his fees were and this is like so nitty gritty but if people are interested in this um <laughs> yeah i mean i think like his fees were that of like a an indie illustrator designer and they were and for us who had no budget i mean we bootstrapped the company up until a couple months ago when we raised a relatively modest pre-seed um yeah they were they were like affordable for us and i just would like encourage people to to work with you know independent illustrators and designers like i think you can use a branding agency but i had so many people tell me you know we had spent probably five thousand dollars on on his graphic work and then natalie Berger, who is who is doing a lot of our recipe development and photography who's also absolutely fantastic also very totally new to food photography and recipe development um i think up until maybe february we'd spent about five grand on all of that's all those assets and that's a rough estimate but i think it's pretty pretty close um and I just had people telling me that the visuals that we put out was a quarter million to half a million dollar job, which like, that's a, it's a very big discrepancy. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I just think like, it's best of all worlds if you can find independent artists because A, like they need support and they like, it's helpful for them to get their work out there in this capacity um and then they can grow with you like danny you know as we grow and get more funding we can like bring him on to do more and more projects because like we had to hack certain ways that we could be able to use his work like he would create these beautiful stickers for us that we could use for a bunch of different things because we just didn't you know we were paying it out of our out of our own bank accounts so that's what i would say if, if people are like trying to come up with sort of their visual language like there are so many artists out there that are not being paid for their work. Um, and like, this is a great channel for them to also like see their work, at least as far as I can tell, to see their work come to life in a really exciting and non-traditional way for, for them. Totally, gosh. And I actually really love your um, photography. I didn't mention that in the beginning, but yeah, I also love that kind of element of what you guys are doing. When it comes to the other piece of the puzzle, so obviously you need to invest in actually the fish and tinning the fish, and I imagine there are MOQs, minimum order quantities, that are through the roof for someone just getting started. What kind of investment or personal cash did you need to put into the brand to get that kind of initial order, and what was that piece like finding the manufacturer and that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, so on the, to your latter question about just finding our partners our, and building our supply chain, it is really, I mean, I guess it, the material story was we started by trying to find a cannery partner in Portugal and Spain, which is obviously where the idea sort of germinated. And we did find one. We had to go through a, a bunch to get to find someone that would hit an MOQ that we felt comfortable with. Um, people. The folks that we talked to it ranged between fifty thousand units to twenty five thousand units, mostly, and that was just like not a good business idea to to get fifty thousand cans of sardines before we launched the brand. Um, it's a lot, and we ended up finding a partner in Galicia that would do ten thousand cans. Which now we're about to launch that product, and that seems like nothing, which is great. But once we started building supply chain in the U.S there were like no MOQs. We were working with all these like micro canneries, which is a double-edged sword because it means we're working with these really like pretty modest, like relatively mom and pop canneries that aren't, you know, pushing out hundreds of thousands of cans a day. Like maybe some of our more industrial canneries in, in Spain and Portugal where this has, yeah. So that's what I'll say. We, we ended up finding partners that really didn't have MOQs um but yeah i think it's that also presents certain questions of maybe their things with scalability that you know will prove to be challenging as we as we continue to grow mm, totally that's so interesting i'm wondering like how you actually found those really small 
canneries. I've never even heard of that word before. <laughs> when you start a company, you just have to talk to, I mean, this is, I hear this from entrepreneurs all the time, but like, you just have to talk to so many people. Like you would talk to everyone. Um, and that was the first like three months of the company was really just, and it, at that point it wasn't really a company. It was just like a thing that we were trying to make happen. Um, but just talking to everyone. So that's sort of our supply chain, I think, and how we've built it has been a story of a mixture of cold calling and finding partners through just research online and, and hitting people up and going through references and like, especially as we, as we've started to really hone in on like what sustainable seafood sourcing means. Like we really have to go to experts that can dig through the bullshit and, um, and find us really great and direct us towards really great partners. I actually really wanted to ask you about this, the the sustainable side of things, because I mean, obviously, um, seaspiracy is on everyone's mind at the moment. I haven't personally watched it yet, but I plan to. Um, and I've been listening to some different podcasts, like Planet Money has been talking about what does sustainable fishing mean? And like, what does it mean for people who do like to eat tinned fish and, and buy this kind of thing? So what does it mean to you guys? And what do you kind of what defines a truly sustainable tinned fish company? Yeah. Um, I think the thing that is confusing to people, and I gave, I mentioned this in an interview recently, but the reason why seafood sustainability, like probably so many other kinds of sustainability is so confusing is because it is just a very multi-layered um, question. So it's not like sardines are sustainable or I mean, there are a couple species and we'll go into that, like mussels and oysters, bivalves are like, are truly an unbelievably sustainable seafood, um, kelp as well. At least at this point, um, yeah, I know you can feel great about eating them. Um, but, but by and large, like just saying the species, um, just saying the region, like that's not enough to determine whether it's sustainable, um, seafood. So you kind of have to look at all these things in context. So it's like the region that the seafood is being sourced from, the way it's being caught. So like sea spiracy, when you watch it, you'll see like a huge problem that they that they broach is bycatch. Um, and there are ways, there are like methods of, of fishing that greatly decrease bycatch. So like, obviously we hear a lot about hook and line, um, which, is by, which is by and large the most sustainable way to catch seafood because you're catching one piece of, you're catching one fish at a time. Whereas with like these big trawl nets, you're like catching a bunch of stuff and potentially um, bringing stuff into the fold that you are not intending to catch and you're not going to sell. And it's just terrible waste. Um, so you just have to look at all these things in, con in, in context. So just to sum it up very quickly, it's the species, the region that you're fishing it from and um, how you're fishing it. And that's for like wild, that's catching wild fish. So something that we have been very excited about and very passionate about and digging into much more because the most recent product we launched, Rainbow Trout, is a product of sustainable aquaculture, is, is just this whole industry of, of, of aquaculture, which, I mean, you'll, you'll watch these beer scene and come up with your own thoughts, but I think by and large, the the conversation has been, yes, this, this documentary has brought up some really important points that we need to be thinking about and need to acknowledge and um, harsh realities we have to face, but also presented a, a totally binary um, perspective on seafood consumption. And the only path forward that was presented was not eating seafood at all, which as we all, or I guess not as we all know, but as we should know, it's just not a viable option for feeding our growing population. And, and there are just so many economies and people that depend on, um, depend on seafood as their primary protein source. It's just not a viable option. Um, so what we need to do is support and figure out ways that we can continue to eat seafood in a way that is sustainable. So for example, um, our rainbow trout, which we launched last weekend is delicious. So I would encourage folks to buy it if they can. That's very tasty. Yeah. Um, but it's a product of land-based aquaculture, which the film doesn't mention at all, which like, if this documentary is 
cutting out whole swaths of an industry of a means of production. Like you have to, your alarm bells should be going off. Right. I've heard it's really like a sensationalist kind of. Yeah. Which like, it's a film, you know, I'm trying to get people to watch it, but like, they don't talk about, they don't talk about sustainable agriculture. They don't talk about, you know, the incredible um, sustainable fishing, hook and line fishing that people are doing in the U.S. They don't talk about the potential for, for mussels and oysters to serve as an incredible source of, of um, protein and iron and all of these things um, that people need to live. Um, so, yes, you should. Your spidey sense should be tingling. Um, but so anyway, like our the farm that we work with, we work with a farm in Idaho on our on our rainbow trout um, and potentially other products in the future. We shall see. Um, but the fish is 100 percent traceable from the egg to the tin what, that we send to you. Um, they harvest all of their eggs themselves and they grow this just or they harvest this gorgeous steelhead and rainbow trout um and there's no like for example they talk about escapes in this film um like ocean escapes where you know you'll have salmon that are you know modified in such a way or they carry disease and then they escape and then they infect other populations etc like these are all things that you know are incredibly important to think about and in systems that do need to be improved um but like land-based aquaculture for example it's totally it, it is totally disconnected from the ocean environment. So like all of those problems that are broached in the, in the documentary um, are eliminated. Got it. Got it. So good to know. Gosh, that's crazy. And it's one of those things like, you know, I've been speaking about it a lot. Obviously it's a hot topic, um, but I haven't watched it yet because I'm like, shit, like, does this mean you have to go vegan? Like I love seafood. <laughs> it's a tough one. <laughs> makes you feel really guilty. I mean, it means you sh you can be thinking much more critically about when you when you order seafood and when you buy it and ask questions, ask your waiter, where did this come from? And and check out really amazing resources like the Monterey Bay Seafood Watch List, um, which looks which examines the sustainability of seafood in that sort of matrix um, of what I was talking about earlier. Um, and make informed decisions. But you do not need to be vegan, and it's totally not a viable option for a lot of people to be vegan. And also, that sort of diet presents many problems of its own. Well, lucky we've got some good options out there. I'm excited to try the fish. I'm excited to try the trout. <laughs> okay, I wanna move on to talk about the launch strategy. Obviously, you're in your first year of business, things are going very, very well. Um, you've launched with some incredible press. You've had, you know, mentions all over the internet. What was the approach to launching and how did you, you know, get all of this buzz happening around the brand? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a couple things. So much of it. I mean, like we all have to acknowledge our various, our various privileges. And like, we were so lucky. My co-founder has a really strong following. Um, across various social media accounts, which I think, and we kind of knew this from the beginning. It was like, if we, we knew that the idea, we knew it was a good idea. Like we knew that people were super excited about, we we knew people were super excited about Tinsy food. Like we just think in our social circles and, and like just going around to different wine bars and, you know, Alison Roman had been such a great uh, advocate for spreading the gospel of anchovies and sardines, all these things. Like the excitement was there. And we knew that if we could get the brand right and the story right, um, like we already had a great platform to jump off of um, because Caroline had, you know, just so many followers and um, just people that were already paying attention. She runs the official Sean Penn Instagram. Is that right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so many lols on there. <laughs> so many lols. Not a lot of overlap with fish necessarily until now um until now but I think that definitely accelerated uh it just accelerating things because our awareness from day one was greater than it would have been if we just if you know neither of us had a platform to to jump off of and so when it comes to things like the press that you got specifically you know, you were featured everywhere. You were mentioned in Lean Lux, Vogue, Condé Nast Traveler, all this amazing press that some brands would dream of getting, 
you know, potentially just in their first year at some point. How did you go about, did you work with a freelancer or did you work with an agency? What was the kind of strategy for the press piece of the puzzle? Yeah. I mean, the first couple of pieces, we got a, we got two pieces in December from Vogue and Refinery29. And those were, we've been, we've been very blessed, like fully, fully blessed. Um, those were inbound. They came to us about writing pieces. And then we've just done our own press. So like I, you know, I had some familiarity with like putting together press releases and all that stuff from working in the music industry. Um, and then had amazing journalist friends that were willing to like look over my press release and make sure it was all good. Um, but <laughs> I think it was, I mean, yeah, I know. Got to just reach out to everyone always. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I do think it was like, I think the timing was also just right. Like people just want to write about, they want to write about Tin Fish. They wanted to write about women founders. But like the branding is really exciting to people. Um, it's, you know, I think the, re the revitalization of the pantry staples, that's very top of mind right now, especially during quarantine. Um, so I think all of the elements combined to just making an interesting press, press story. Um, there's like, there's a lot to be sort of unpacked in it. So yeah, I think that, I mean, I guess just as another bid, like, I think when you're starting a thing, like definitely just try to do everything yourself for as long as you can, because you'll learn how to do it. So when you do eventually hire someone, you'll like, you'll have a really strong understanding of it. Um, so yeah, we haven't hired anyone to do press for us. Yes. I'm yet. I'm, I imagine we'll, we'll, we'll hire an agency for launches in the future. Once our attentions have to be really firmly planted elsewhere. Um, and I think, you know, if we had an agency, maybe we would have gotten more press on different various things, but it, it's expensive. And we're like, we are, as they Saving say, those dollars. <laughs> yeah, I know. We're like, Trying to be, trying to do it scrappy, trying to be some scrappy ladies. I love that for you guys, though. What do you think is driving your growth now? Like, is it word of mouth or is it these, you know, really interesting press pieces or what is it? Or is it paid advertising? Yeah. So we haven't, we haven't done any paid advertising yet. Um, I think it's, it's, it's word of mouth. It's working with the right partners. Like, you know, we're just starting to expand into retail and we are just being very thoughtful about who we partner with on that. Like we've gotten a ton of amazing inbound requests from retailers, but it's like, first of all, our bandwidth is I'm right now. It's just me as the full-time employee and Caroline is, has an insane job as like a very successful TV writer writing on Mindy Kaling's new show. Um, so it's just like, we have to be extremely thoughtful about how we use our energy and resources. Um, because like, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're finite, like we can't just do everything all the time. So, um, so yes, I, I'm sorry. I wasn't answering that question very specifically, but it's like picking the right partners. Like we launched with this amazing um, store in LA called wine and eggs. That was also just like really buzzy and it just opened up. People were super excited about it. And like the, you know, those sort of combinations are shit has just been flying off the shelves there because people are like so excited about this place. They're like running to it in droves. And then they like hear about our company and they're like, Oh my God, like two female run businesses. And it's just like those sort of partnerships that just feel so right. Just pop off and get people super excited and it just feels really authentic because it fully fully is um so it's that i mean we're going to be doing a ton of really fun partnerships like that um and then i think it's yeah it's it's just like the these factors combining the reality is that i felt this so much working in music and feel it so much doing this business is like it has to be authentic or like the more authentic that it is, the more people are going to be excited about it. And I look at other amazing women founders that were in a similar situation to us where it's just like, they loved this. They loved this product or like, this is part of their heritage or like what, like I think about 
Jing, who runs Fly by Jing, who like wanted to tell this incredible story and just created this absolutely delicious product that tells that story so authentically. And it's, you know, tied to where she's from and all these things. I think about like Melanie Mazarin, who runs Gia, who uh, same story. It's like totally a part of her heritage and is like so aligned with her personal style. And when it's like that and it's just like so true and there's no, nothing between the founder and the audience. It just really resonates. And then I guess the last thing I would say is just, it really does help when you are your incepting founding audience. So like me and Caroline, we're two women who live in like a city in the big city in the U S and like, we like care about trends. We like care about sustainability and like all these things. And that's sort of more between the ages of like 22 and 35. And that's like sort of our target demo for, or at least where we're, we're starting to build our audience. Um, and yeah, it, it really helps when you're not like when you're so close to it because you know it would be really exciting to you as a consumer, um, and then you can just create that for sure. And I and I see I feel that with those with those brands that you mentioned and those female uh, founders that you've just mentioned. Um, I had Melanie on the show recently, and I just love her story and you know spending her summers with her grandma drinking you know those homemade recipes like bringing that storytelling to life and in such a bold visual way I mean it's just it's a no-brainer of why it does so well and of course I'm sure the product I haven't tried it but I'm sure the product is like absolutely amazing and and then it's the perfect recipe literally <laughs> yeah it's so yeah if you're able to hit all of those things it's like what is stopping you exactly I want to talk about the flip side of business. We've focused on all the great stuff that's going on for you guys and this, you know, perfect storm that's been whipping up. But what are the biggest challenges that you've faced or what is one of the biggest challenges that you're coming across now, you know, a few months in? Mm. Yeah, I mean, there, there are definitely a few. I think it's just like we were so lucky. Um, I think, yeah, it's kind of the flip side of the coin that we're talking about. We were so lucky to be to get so much interest really early on, but like we straight up were doing everything. We were, we were like doing product development, we were fundraising and we were launching all at the same time. So it wasn't, I mean, there are definitely a lot of brands that spend a year or two in like incubation, product development, all of these things, and then launch with everything sort of ready to go. And that was, that's not our story. And like, that's, I think you can do it either way. Like there are definitely pros and cons to both. I think we just felt such, um, the timing was so good that we just moved really quickly. Um, but that's definitely like, I mean, it's put it's like certain strains on things. Like it's just making sure, so like well, obviously we've sold out a couple of times, which is great, but it's also a product of, you know, like, getting it's growing pains it's like getting your supply chain up and running and being like okay we need like this much product all, all the time um which is which is fine and people have been like patient and understand that you know we are an undercapitalized business and couldn't go out and buy 50,000 tins right from the outset because who, who's paying for it um but you know would i have liked us to be in stock like for the past four months yeah that would have been great. I would have loved that. I would have loved to just be getting as many people to try as possible. Um, so I think that, and then it's just, I think it's, it's all of these questions about sustainability and making sure that we, you know, are, are fulfilling that and, and are making really responsible sourcing choices. Um, and like, we've been learning, that's the thing you just learn so much so fast when you're starting a company. Um, so we've been really lucky to have amazing advisors and people helping us out and, and directing us towards making responsible choices. But again, it's like it's these situations where so many entrepreneurs do not come or and like food entrepreneurs, I think definitely, especially they like come from non-traditional backgrounds. And so it's not like I'd been working for years in the seafood industry. So I like fully recognize I have so much to learn um, and have been lucky to have really smart people help out, but they're still like, there's a lot, there's a lot to learn. It's a journey. <laughs> it's a journey ahead of you, an exciting one. Oh gosh, I love it. I love it. So cool. What is your biggest piece of advice for 
women who have a big idea and want to start their own business? I think the piece of advice that we were given um, and fully led to us moving so quickly. And I think you kind of have to take this with a grain of salt because I think this has led to a lot of issues in the startup world, like Silicon Valley world, which there was, there's definitely an ethos of the move, move fast and break things philosophy where you just like go, you get your MVP, your minimum viable product out there as soon as possible. So you can test it, get consumer feedback and keep iterating off of that. Um, and that piece Asking your, asking your consumers, asking your customers what they think about your product at every turn is like definitely, that is like the only piece of advice that's like 100% always do that. Like if you're not talking to your customers, why? This is like the most helpful resource that you have available. Um, but we like, yeah, I mean, we, we did launch, we launched like this little beta box really early on that was basically samples that we had gotten from from like different canneries that we were talking to and like immediately started getting consumer feedback from that, which was really helpful. Um, and definitely just accelerated things really quickly because as people got really excited about the company, it was like, we just got to move really fast um, to develop your first official products. So what am I saying? I think get customer feedback as soon as you can by launching the brand. And you hear this all the time, like, I think like Nick Sharma, who's like, a, seems to be a very hot brand guru, who I'm sure you've heard about, um, would like create like fake websites or something to just like test a brand um, and get feedback on it. And if you, you, you just like got to think of those hacks and, and a way to, to get your brand in front of people to see if they're, or your brand or your product in front of people to see if they would want to buy it. Um, so yeah, I would say like talk to your customers. Do try to test something with customers as quickly as possible. Always be asking people their opinion. And then just like generally, I mean, you just have to talk to so many people to do this. And you should because it will lead you in incredible directions that will allow you to build your business. So at the end of every episode, I ask everyone on the show a series of six quick questions. And some of it we might have already touched on, but I ask them nonetheless. So question number one is, what's your why? Why do you do what you do? Um, I just think there's so much potential for what we're doing, like in terms of educating and supporting sustainable seafood. And um, I, yeah, I think there's just so much in every direction. I think there's so much potential for, for this category. Oh, love it. I'm so here for it. <laughs> Question number two is, what do you think has been the number one marketing moment so far that made the business pop? Oh my gosh. Um, I mean, I don't know if this counts, but like, I just think when we launched our visuals, like for the first time, people were just like, oh my God, this is insane. So like full credit to Danny on that because he made them. So <laughs> the moment was picking a, a really awesome illustrator to, to represent the brand. I was one of those people, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Question number three is, where do you hang out to get smarter? What are you reading or listening to or subscribing to on the internet these days um, that other people should know about? I mean, I'll fully say that like the first four months of the business, I just listened to all of how I built this and learned so much. Um, so like, yeah, if you're starting a business, like definitely listen to that podcast because it will teach you so many, so many things. Um, yeah, I feel like that's, and then, yeah, I mean, Dan Frommer's The New Consumer is like an amazing, amazing newsletter that really analyzes consumer trends. We had a feature come out this morning. Check it out. Very, very grateful for that. So question number four is how do you win the day? And that's around your AM and PM rituals that keep you feeling happy and motivated and successful. Love it. Um, I am a runner, so just came back from run this morning and it has saved my life. Um, yeah, I run. There are a few different places in LA that I run and I always, it's like, it is just true. It is where I come up with a lot of ideas. Um, so yeah, running and then what else? Um, I try to leave my phone outside of my bedroom because it's terrible to have it in there, but I'm not good at it, but I am working towards that goal. <laughs> <laughs> 
I want to work towards that goal too. I like talk about doing that all the time. I've never done it once, not even once, but like I want to be that person. <laughs> I did it for a week and it made me feel like a complete person again. I need to get on this. I need to try. Maybe tonight. I'm going to try tonight. I'm going to report back. <laughs> I'll just hit myself in the face. <laughs> I'm going to report back. <laughs> lol all right question number five is if you are we up to number five yeah if you only had a thousand dollars left in the business bank account where would you spend it oh my gosh I mean I would probably buy more fish because then I could sell the fish and then I would have more money (laughs) (laughs) perfect (laughs) way to do it and question number six last question is how do you deal with failure what's your mindset and approach when stuff doesn't go to plan? Um, I think it's just, I mean, you just gotta say, okay, what did we do wrong here? Like, I think try to, um, try to like lay the groundwork for failure by like always being honest and trap, you know, just, uh, what is it? Like having a paper trail, like get me- there's a phrase I'm looking for. It's like keeping your tracks, tracking something. I don't know, whatever. Just like, Ne- always be very honest and then like whatever happens in your failure like y- if you were acting genuinely and you were trying to do the right thing then like that's all you can that's all you can say like you learn from it but like your intentions were good <laughs> and just yeah keep going just own it basically <laughs> just own it. yeah just own it yeah I saw a company just very very quickly there was a company I saw that like had huge delays on their like their orders and they just sent a huge email to their customers that were like hey this is what happened and it was so nitty-gritty it was like our company ran out of this seasoning blah blah blah, blah and just like really gave it gave all the details and I was like yeah that sounds really 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 challenging I'm like I get it and I appreciate it. <laughs> I bet that's what everyone said. And I appreciate you just being honest. Totally. Oh, love it. Becca, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your story and your fish. I'm just so pumped for the day that you expand into the UK and beyond so I can be, you know, your first subscriber, international subscriber. Subscriber? Yeah, I want to subscribe to Tin oh, yeah. Fish. At some point we'll have a subscription, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the show.